was listening to one of my favorite conservative commentaries the other day on the radio, Alexi's on the web. <clears throat> and one of the reasons I like him is because he pursues things from a biblical worldview. And because he does, many of his listeners, when they email or write in, they have questions from that bent. And one of the questions he was answering this day was, this world is becoming more and more evil. What are we as Christians supposed to do? Now, if you listen to Steve much at all, you know that he is not an advocate of being a disinterested bystander. He advocates standing against evil whenever the opportunity presents itself. So the question this day, though, was more along the lines of, we're losing the battle. And after I've stood, then what do I do? Now, Steve grew up a Marvel comic books fan. I mean, as a little kid, he owned every superhero comic book there was. He's also been a fan of all the movies made from the Marvel comic books in recent years. And so, as he thought about his response, his mind went immediately to the second in the Batman series, a movie entitled The Dark Knight. And in that movie, Batman is up against his arch nemesis, the Joker. The Joker is an evil, maniacal, corrupt villain for whom nothing is too evil to do. And the city of Gotham is relying upon Batman to take care of the Joker and relieve them of this oppression. Now, Batman is a man of character and scruples. And while he could fight evil with evil, he's not willing to do that. And so the city is turning on him. People are dying. He's getting a bad rap everywhere he goes. And he's wondering, what do I do? So he goes and he talks to his, his butler, his mentor, his friend, Alfred. He says, people are dying, Alfred. What would you have me to do? And Alfred responds, endure, Master Wayne, take it. They will hate you for it, but that's the point of Batman. He can be the outcast. He can make the choice that no one else can make, the right choice. With that scene as a backdrop then, Steve paused in responding to his listener and thoughtfully said, we endure, that's what we do, we endure. We live in the same world that Steve lives in, his listeners live in. It's an evil world. Many of us try to structure our lives to cocoon away from it, to hibernate from it, to not be involved in it. I admit that even myself, I at times want to do the same thing. We have turned off virtually all news. My blood pressure has gone down, but on the other hand, I may not be quite as aware as what I need to be. I listen to a couple of places, but it's also what makes it so wonderful to be in the bee yard. Because in the bee yard, nothing else matters. It's peaceful most of the time. It's calm. We often are working together. Sometimes it's hard to argue with the old saying that ignorance is bliss. But thinking about the sermonette, this is actually in my notes. 
no matter how we trim the wicks on our lamps, from dim to bright, or if we even light them at all, no matter how much or how little salt we spread in the world around us, the world will eventually find us, and it's going to force us to take sides. Matthew 24, verse 8. In response to the disciples asking him about the end of the age, Jesus is talking here and giving them a rather detailed answer. And we're breaking right into the middle of that answer. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 8. All of these, the things he's already discussed, are the beginning of sorrows. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they're going to kill some of you. And you're going to be hated of all the nations for my name's sake. Don't pass over those words for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. They're going to betray one another. They will hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. I used to read false prophets and think only spiritual. <clears throat> Does anybody know the name John Kerry? There's false prophecies right there. There are all kinds of false prophecies in our society. And because iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold, but he or she that shall endure unto the end, in spite of all these things I've said, shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So it sounds as though this idea of endurance, being able to endure, is pretty important. But what does it mean to endure? In Greek, the word translated here, endure, is Strong's 5278. It's a Greek word that means to remain. You've heard the term intestinal fortitude, to sustain, to deal positively with the circumstances you find yourself in. You know, in 1611, the word endure was the best English word the translators could come up with. It's the noun form of endurance. I'm sorry, it's the verb form of the noun endurance, the act of enduring. The English word means the ability to continue doing something painful or difficult for a long period of time without complaining. It comes to the English and the French. And in French, it meant to undergo or suffer without breaking, to continue in existence. And then the French, the French got the word from Old French and Latin. The idea being in Latin, to make hard, to keep up, to maintain. So now when we hear Jesus saying, but he or she that shall endure to the end, that person shall be saved. The definition shed a little bit more clarity of that statement. He wasn't talking about enduring temptation to sin. He wasn't talking about enduring the temptation to do something we shouldn't do. He's talking about enduring pain and suffering that will come our way because of our allegiance to him for his namesake. Scripture is full of all kinds of examples of endurance. First one that came to my mind was that of Joseph. We all know the story well, but we're going to hit a few highlights beginning in Genesis 37. Genesis, Genesis 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children. You may remember that Joseph was Rachel's firstborn. The first child 
that she actually had. And because Joseph was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably unto him. It's interesting to me that Joseph's persecution started because of his father's love for him and the reciprocated love back to his father. How about our love, our God's love for us, Christ's love for us, and our love back to him as a starting point for some of our persecution. So go on through the chapter, Joseph's relationship with his brothers only deteriorates. It doesn't improve. And finally, his brothers sell him into slavery. Reminds me of Matthew 10, 21. Verse 26. And Judah said to his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother? And then we go and hide him somewhere. There's no money in that. Let's go and sell him to the Ishmaelites. <clears throat> And let not our hand be upon him. Let's not kill him. He is, after all, our brother. is our flesh and blood. And so his brother, his brothers were content to sell him for the money. In Genesis 39, verse 1, we read what first happened to Joseph. He's brought down to Egypt to Potiphar, an office of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him out of the hand of the Ishmaelites, the ones that brought him to Egypt. In verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hands. You read that, you can almost forget all that Joseph's been through to this point. Yeah, he, Joseph, God gave him grace in the sight of his owner, but he was still owned. He couldn't just walk out tomorrow and go home or meet some young lady and get married and have a family. He was a slave. But then, in verse 19, he's betrayed by Potiphar's wife. It came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, After this manner did your servant to me, and his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there. Joseph now found himself in a prison cell. Joseph was innocent. He upheld God's standards. He did what was right. He's imprisoned by someone he thought he had a really good relationship with. But he's still in prison. Genesis 40, verse 13. It's been there a short while. And he interprets a prisoner's dream. Verse 13. Speaking to the butler who's been thrown into prison. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you shall deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand. And after the former manner, when you were his butler. But when you get there, when you're back in Pharaoh's good graces, don't forget about me. Think on me when it should be well with you, and show kindness, I pray, unto me. And make mention of me to Pharaoh. And get me out of this place. Well, it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all of his servants. And he did, in fact, lift up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And the butler gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hung the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to him. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Again, let down to endure more prison food, more being chained to the wall or locked behind the bars. Until finally, 
Genesis 41, verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of two full years. How many prayers do you think Joseph prayed in those two years? Only to see one more day go by, and he was still there. Two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. In verse 14, we know Pharaoh has the dream. We know what the dream is. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And they shaved him and changed his clothing, and he came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. And there's none that can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that you can't understand dreams and interpret them. And so Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh the same God that's allowed him to rot in prison for two years, be sold into slavery. <clears throat> and Joseph is still loyal. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. We all know where it goes from there. Joseph endured, and he endured, and he stayed loyal to God. Second person that came to my mind was Paul. Paul is the picture you find when you look in the dictionary, find the definition of the word endurance. Perhaps second only to the other man we'll talk about here after a while. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. And he's talking about others who claim to be wonderful ministers. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In threat of death, more often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. I've been a night and a day floating on a board in the ocean. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, and in the wilderness, in the sea, and among false brethren. I have been in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. I've been cold. And I've been naked. And besides those things are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul endured more pain and suffering than any of us have yet had the opportunity to endure. And yet, he remained faithful. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 <clears throat> Timothy, Timothy, as you know, is sort of like Paul's protege, the son he never had. He's giving Timothy some fatherly advice, some mentoring advice, something good for all of us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. But Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, what I teach, my manner of life, my life's purpose my faith, that I am long-suffering with love toward others and patience. You know all about the persecutions, the afflictions which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But all of them, or out of all of them, the Lord always delivered me. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. None of us will escape it. For some, it might be mild. For others, it might be life-threatening. 
but it will be required of all of us in one way or another sooner or later. Second Timothy chapter four, verses five through eight. Just a few more paragraphs of Paul talking to Timothy. Endurance and encouragement. But watch you in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, fulfill God's purpose in your life. <clears throat> For I'm not going to be with you much longer. I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Timothy, you do yours. Because henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all of them also, who love is appearing. And I expect to see you there, Timothy. I can't help when I read these verses and not talk about Hebrews 11, not think about Hebrews 11, 6 and Romans 8, 28. In a few minutes, we're going to combine these ideas of endurance with the ideas <clears throat> of faith in Hebrews 11 and God's walking with us in Romans 8. But here in 2 Timothy, Paul's life summarizes for us all of those things together. To bring them all together in one place and one life, and that's Paul's life. Before we go on and talk about that and kind of wrap all those things together, we've got to draw a distinction between perseverance and endurance because those are not the same thing. Perseverance is the act of a person working on a project where he is or she is working on the outside. They are working on the environment, the person persevering is doing all the action toward what they're working on. Endurance is the other way around. And I'm going to give you two examples. You all know Thomas Edison. He's a notable example of what it means to persevere. This is perseverance. Edison, we know him from the light bulb. And we know that he tried and tried and tried and tried all different kinds of things, hundreds of different materials to try to find a filament that would work in a light bulb. He finally found something. Believe it or not, they were bamboo fibers. They weren't even metal. And bamboo fibers were the first filaments in light bulbs. But after that, he continued to have to experiment. It took him 2,774 more experiments to finally get a light bulb that would work. It would be cheap enough and easy enough to produce that the population could afford to buy one. He also worked on a battery. He was trying to make what we know today is the battery you put into your whatever you want to run, clock, your light, um, flashlight, whatever. Walter Mallory wrote an autobiography of Edison. And he wrote this account of a conversation he had with Edison and the circumstances around it as he was working on the battery. <clears throat> This, this, the research, had been going on for more than five months, seven days a week. And I was finally called down to the laboratory to see him. That is, that is, I found him at a bench about three feet wide and 12 feet long, on which there were hundreds of little test cells that had been made up by his core of chemists and experimenters. I then learned that he had thus made over 9,000 experiments in trying to devise this new type of storage battery, but had not yet produced a single thing that promised to solve the question. 
in the view of this immense amount of thought and labor, my sympathy got the better of my judgment. And I ask him, isn't it a shame that with the tremendous amount of work you've done, you haven't been able to get any results? And Edison's head turned around like a flash and put a big old smile on his face and he said, results? Why, man, I have gotten lots of results. I know several thousand things that won't work. That is perseverance. Nobody was beating on Edison. Edison was manipulating other things. He was in total control of what's going on. He just had to keep going and not give up. Endurance, on the other hand, is something wholly different. Endurance is a person's response to the outside forces that are acting upon him or her, over which he has no control. There might be a goal the person's trying to achieve, like staying alive, or like in Paul's case, continuing to be alive to serve the churches, but that's not necessary to have endurance. For example, the military pilot in World War II who shot down in cold Atlantic waters. And he has to endure 48 hours in the cold water until somebody comes and rescues him. The skier who's caught in an avalanche and buried in snow, he's got to endure that frightening situation, hoping that that St. Bernard sniffs her out and saves her life. In my days in Louisiana, the people who stay in their home for the hurricane and the wind howls and the water rises and it's pitch black because the power is gone and they endure all of these outside influences on them, hoping to be alive in the morning. Endurance is when it's being done to you and you have little or no control of the situation and you don't give up. That's endurance. We mentioned Paul earlier. The best example, the first picture in a dictionary is that of Jesus Christ. Endurance. His only available response was to not give up, to live through it, and to get to the other side. Hebrews 12, verse 2 the author of Hebrews gives us a good one-verse summary. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, so he did have a goal. He knew why he was doing what he was doing, why he was going through what he was going through. He knew where he wanted to end up. The joy he was going to experience on the other side of all this. For that joy... He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down the right hand of the throne of God. We know this story as well as we know the story of Joseph. As we go through this, let it cement in our minds the difference between endurance and perseverance. Matthew 26 67, 68. Again, talking about Jesus Christ. After being questioned by Caiaphas, the high priest, the soldiers spit in his face. They hit him. They smote him with the palms of their hands. They mocked him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that just struck you? Next chapter, 27, verse 2. When they had bound him, they led him away, delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. In chapter 27, verse 26, then after Pilate questions Jesus, he washes his hands in the matter. He yields to the will of the people and he releases Barabbas into them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the common hall and gathered unto him with a whole band of soldiers. They brought in all their buddies. Come look at this guy. 
They stripped him down. Can you imagine? The humil the, being humbled in that way. Be they put on him a scarlet robe. When they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And then they mocked him again by bowing before him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. What are you going to do now? And they spit on him. They took the reed and they struck him with it on the head. And then after they had mocked him and beat on him, they took the robe off from him, put his own clothes back on him, and led him away to crucify him. John 19, 30, don't turn there. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Jesus did what we've been asked to do. He endured to the very end. The past few months, in various sermons I've given, most of them here, I've dealt with the meanings of several words. Some of these, I hope, have been helpful as far as study and as far as understanding. We talked about in one sermon the word blessed in the Beatitudes. We talked about faith a lot. Hebrews 11, 6. We talked about what belief is. What do we believe in? The soldier who said to Jesus, help my unbelief. In studying this idea of endurance, two other words have popped up repeatedly. One of them is patience. The other is hope. Now, if I ask all of you in this room, do you know somebody who lacks patience? You could point to somebody and say, yeah, my husband or my wife. You know somebody who lacks patience. There's only, there's a catch though. In the New Testament, what you just thought of in your mind is virtually never what it means in the New Testament. The word patience in the New Testament comes from one of three different, very closely related words. The predominant one is Strong's 5281, 5281. I'm not going to try to pronounce it in English. Transliterated, it would be spelled H U P O M O N E. And it means cheerful endurance. We've been just describing endurance. I think you all know what the word cheerful means. So just put cheerful in front of endurance and you've got the word patience in the New Testament. So here in a few minutes, we look at several verses that are going to combine a lot of these ideas together for us. You want to, you want to remember that definition for patience. One example for right now, 1 Peter 2, verse 20. A word, a, a, a scripture you know well. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. You endure it cheerfully. But if when you do well, think Joseph, and you suffer for it, and you take it patiently, you endure it cheerfully, this is acceptable with God. Dr. McC Dr. Peter McCullough is a walking, talking example of this scripture. Dr. McCullough has been a world-renowned heart specialist, cardiologist, celebrated for his knowledge, understanding, and skill when it comes to the heart all over the world. If you were involved in medicine, you knew his name. He was educated at Baylor, the University of Texas, Southwestern Medical School, University of Michigan, and University of Washington. He has over a thousand published articles in the medical journals relating to the heart. 
has been cited over 600 times in the National Library of Medicine. He's founder of the Cardiorenal Society of America. He's editor in chief of two major medical journals. One of the most preeminent, if not the most preeminent at one time, cardiologist again in the world. Prior to COVID, Dr. McCullough was an administrator at Baylor Scott and White Heart and Vascular Hospital in Dallas. And he had his own thriving practice at the Baylor University Medical Center. With the advent of COVID and the perceived impact that COVID was going to have on heart patients and just the heart itself and creating heart problems, Dr. McCullough became one of the most vocal and foremost doctors seeking the truth about COVID and also seeking the truth on the best way to treat the disease because his patients were at risk. Because he con continually sought the truth, spoke the truth, and because what he had to say didn't fit the narrative, he was soon fired from all of his positions at Baylor University medical facilities. But since he still had many admitting privileges at Baylor, after being fired from Baylor, he started his own private practice outside the university, but still could have patients in the Baylor Hospital. <clears throat> he continued to speak out, continued to search for the truth, continued to speak the truth about COVID. But since he wouldn't be quiet, Baylor finally said, you can't bring your patients to our hospital anymore. You got to do something else. So he moved to a large practice of other doctors and just became one of their doctors in their practice. Well, Baylor wasn't done with him. So Baylor said, okay, we're going to sue you to get you to shut up. The, the, <clears throat> the consortium of doctors where he worked we don't want this headache. We don't want this notoriety. Sorry, doc, you gotta leave. Shortly after that, the major accrediting institution that accredits doctors and cardiologists revoked his credentials. He was no longer able to practice medicine. Undaunted, there were other doctors who were also telling the truth. They formed a company called the Wellness Company. And even though he's unable at present to practice himself, the other doctors in the organization are, and they continue to operate as an organization. And he continues to speak out the truth about COVID, the vaccines, and all things related. We read 1 Peter 2, verse 20, for what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you endure cheerfully, but if you do well and suffer for it, you also endure cheerfully. That's what's acceptable to God. I have no way of knowing what Dr. McCullough's relationship is with God, what his spiritual standing is with God. I do know that one of the things that God hates more than any other is lies. I do know that God loves the truth. Here is a real life example of taking it patiently. And all that Dr. McCullough has endured, he's endured it cheerfully. If you ever hear him speak, you won't hear any bitterness in his voice. You won't hear any vindictive words coming out of his mouth. Nothing evil to say about those that have persecuted him. Oh, he may speak about a counter lawsuit or something like that, but only in calm, rational terms. He simply goes on trying to help those who want to be helped. The other word besides patience was the word hope. 
all of us can relate to what the word hope means in our common everyday language. Dear young lady, I hope he asks me out. You ever heard your mom say, I hope I didn't forget to turn the stove off before I left? I hope I win the lottery with this new lottery ticket I just bought. If you're playing Monopoly, I hope I roll a 10 so I can go by go and collect $200. We're going to build a work on the deck tomorrow. I hope it doesn't rain. In every case, we hope for the outcome we want, but there's no guarantee it's going to happen. We just hope it's going to happen. In scripture, the meaning of the word hope is quite different. It's not a wishful hope but it is a confidence that something is going to happen. In the New Testament, the word is one of two. If it's depending upon part of speech, it's either 1679 or 1680. It means to expect to happen, to anticipate with expectation that it will happen. There's no maybe, there's no it might be, there no, there's no, it, it, there's no, I hope so. It is a surety, a guarantee it's going to be. So to this point, <clears throat> we basically have spent the whole sermon on definitions. I'm back teaching language arts again, vocabulary class. We define endurance, perseverance, patience, and hope. Now let's look at a few scriptures that put the whole thing together. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 12. Again, Jesus is speaking. And he says, you know, it just strikes me too. So I'm trying to Paint a middle picture. Jesus is talking to the disciples. Now imagine how bad life was being in Judea under Roman rule, under Jewish rule for that matter. How bad did they, when they looked out around the world, how bad did they think it was? And then they hear Jesus say things like this. And because iniquity shall be multiplied, what do you mean multiplied? It's already pretty evil. But he says, because iniquity shall be multiplied. Think about our world today. The love of many shall wax cold. And don't just read that waxing cold as spiritual. Don't just read that as the loss of the love of the truth as we understand the truth. You know, Roe v. Wade was struck down, what, almost two years ago? You ever notice how hard society is trying to hang on to the legal right to kill children? In Canada now, one of the fastest growing medical procedures is assisted suicide. You ever look at them, ever look at the uh, kill rate in Chicago on any given weekend? Not to mention the mass shootings we have. The hatred of some on the left toward anyone conservative. The love of many, the normal, natural, God-given human love is waxing cold. But he or she that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Mark 13 is Mark's recollection of the same conversation. And Mark says, Mark 13, verse 12, and brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father of his child, and children shall rise up against parents. Lawsuits brought by children against their parents because the parent will not affirm their gender identity. And then parent going to jail, or worse, because they're trying to save their kid. Children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. It may also be a neighbor, 
a friend, a coworker, anyone who doesn't like the fact that you're not going along with the woke standards, the governmental standards, and you name the name of Jesus Christ and his standards. And you shall be hated of all men. There's that phrase I keep coming back to. Because, for my name's sake. Because you live the way Jesus taught. You claim the authority of Jesus Christ. But he that endures the hatred and the persecution to the end, the same shall be saved. Back up a few chapters to Mark chapter 4. As you go through the rest of these these uh, scriptures, they're in no set order. They're just in the order that I found them and thought about them and put them down. So they're just, I guess you might say, random thoughts, but you can put this together in your mind the way it works for you. Here in Mark 4, verse 16, we're in the middle of the parable, the sower and the seed, and what happens when the seeds sprout. Mark 4, 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, <clears throat> who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves, and so they endure for a time. But afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. How often I've read past those words have no root in themselves. You've heard the phrase putting down roots. It's taking Alethe and I 20 some years to put down roots in Hopkinsville, and I'm still not sure that we're very well rooted, that we're really that attached to where we are, especially once you get off the farm. But you know, people who travel a lot sometimes long to have that opportunity. Now that I've gotten off script, I've got to find where I am again. Prior to the study I've done in the last number of sermons, two or three sermons, I don't know that I would understand this phrase the way I think I do now. In this parable, when the difficult times came, these folks had not developed a deep faith yet. They still weren't sure that God is really who he says he is, that he expects them to do and act and behave a certain way. Perhaps they hadn't spent the time in scriptures they needed to. Perhaps they hadn't developed the other friendships that they needed, friendships with, friendships with other believers, people with whom they could share their lives. Perhaps they had, I don't know, they just were not connected the way they needed to be with God. There are lots of aspects of our lives that define our spiritual roots. How deep are our spiritual roots? Romans 8, 24. Romans 8, 24 to 25. For we are saved by hope. And don't forget our definition of hope in the Bible. But hope that is seen is not hope. In other words, we've already received the reward. It's not hope anymore. It's happened. It's done. For what a man sees, what he already has, why does he yet hope for it? He's got it. For some 40-some years, I hoped for a life. Don't hope for a wife anymore. I've got one. Very good one. But if we hope, if we know for a certainty for what we see not, the reward's been promised to us, then do we with patience, with cheerful endurance, we wait for it. I'm, I keep going back to, I'm sorry I'm a broken record, but it means so much to me. Hebrews 11.6. 
Part of faith is a belief that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But like all those listed in Hebrews 11, we must endure the rough ride and have patience, endure cheerfully. Romans 15, verse 4, just over a couple of pages. For whatsoever things were written aforetime. Now, what he's talking about is the Old Testament scriptures. They were written for our learning that we through cheerful endurance and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope, might know with a surety that God will reward those that diligently seek him. Comfort of the scriptures. The folks without the deep roots didn't have internalized the comfort of the scriptures. The scripture is also interesting to me because like Mark 6, I'm sorry, Mark 4, 16 and 17, it gives us a clue to how we endure cheerfully. The comfort of the scriptures, the reading of the scriptures, reading about people like Joseph and putting ourselves in his place and saying, if he could do it, I can do it. But also from meditating on our own experiences in our own lives. That's why I think it's so important to somehow in our minds, whether we log it in a journal or we retell the stories or whatever, to constantly recount to ourselves all the times that God has acted in our lives directly to where we can say that was God. There's no other reason. There's no other way to explain it because that's what will help us when we really need encouragement moving through those times of endurance. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. Paul here writing to the church in Thessalonica giving them high praise and compliments for their endurance. This is out of the American Standard Version. We are bound to give thanks to God always for your brethren, even as it is deserving, for that your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of each one of you all toward one another abounds. Again, they're growing roots. They know that God is who he says he is, and they're tying themselves to one another. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your cheerful endurance and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions which you endure. Hebrews 10, 34. Here the author of Hebrews is speaking. And saying to those reading, for you had compassion on me in my bonds. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. In other words, giving me the things I needed from your own. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an everlasting substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, your hope, which will be greatly rewarded. For you have need of patience, of cheerful endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. As you might remember, he will re reward those that diligently seek him. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will no longer tarry. I hope it's not seemed too disjointed today. I hope that you're hearing all these themes and meshing them together. Faith, the belief that God is who he says he is, that he rewards those that diligently seek him. Hope, the confidence we can have in God to fulfill his promises. Patience and endurance, the idea that he will never leave us or forsake us, but we have to endure. And we probably haven't seen the worst of it yet. And it won't be easy. 
Hebrews 12, verse 1, or 1 and 2. We're about to wrap this up. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, those he listed in chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight. What is weighing your life down that needs to be laid aside? And remove the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with cheerful endurance the race that is set before us, God's purpose for our lives. And look into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. And again, I, used to, I had a friend who hated going to the dentist. He dreaded going to the dentist. And the only way he got through it was in his mind, walking in the dentist office, he was already thinking about what he would do as soon as he got out of the dentist office. And that was his total focus. And then he got through the experience in the dentist office. What is it saying here? Jesus was looking to returning home to his dad. Seeing us have the opportunity to get to know his father. Looking forward to seeing us in his kingdom. Looking forward to seeing the salvation of all mankind. That's what got him through. For that joy, he endured the cross, despising the shame. It is set down <clears throat> the right hand of the throne of God. Christ, our example, James 1, verses 2 and through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, do you really believe, builds cheerful endurance. But let your cheerful endurance have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And putting this sermon on endurance together, I found that it's sort of wrapped in a nice, complete picture for me. A lot of the things I've been thinking about for some time. There are five scriptures there in italics. We're not going to turn to any of those. For your own reference, and I've referenced some of them already. But in closing, I just want to give you a summary of my thoughts of the things that I've been thinking about again over the past few months as I've put several of these together. For whatever reason, God has called me. One out, one out of 330 million in this country for some purpose both here in this life and in the next. And he's the painter of this picture that I'm trying to see. The overall theme of the picture is faith. The ironclad belief that I must develop that God is who he says he is. And that if I follow him, he will reward me beyond my wildest dreams. And based, <clears throat> and based upon those beliefs, I walk out my life day by day. Sometimes things go really well. Other days, <clears throat> there are significant problems, difficulties, obstacles to overcome. But either way, I believe that God has my best interest at heart. And that he will make sure that all things work together for whatever is best for me in eternity. All I have to do, and it's not always that easy, all I've got to do is to stick close to him, endure to the end, so that I can receive the reward that he has for me.